Hi gang, welcome back. Hope you missed us. We are in a different part of the same office, a different wall. Hope you enjoy that. Um, this episode today is actually brought to you by Goldfish. Uh, so if you see me eating something in the middle of the video, don't think it's weird. They're just goldfish. It's the official meal of the Mississippi <laughs> State debate team, that and Subway. <laughs> um, so yeah, hey everybody, welcome back to Hail State Debate. Uh, it is now, by the time you're watching this, either February or close to February, and we know how badly you want these videos, so we are here to serve the people. And it is time to prepare for the February PF topic, which is resolved. The United States should end its arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, as always, a few notes to begin with. Uh, everything we cite, or very nearly everything we cite, we do have limited space, is going to be in the notes below. The timestamps for the different sections are going to be in the notes below. Uh, if it's useful to you, maybe give us a like, maybe subscribe, maybe tell a friend about it. We certainly want this to be helpful to everybody. And remember, like we announced last month, we are also now on Twitter, uh, at Hale State Debate, because sometimes we come up with arguments or ideas or stuff that, uh, you know, we can't necessarily fit into the video or that we learn about after the video. Right. Uh, can't drop a new video uh, to supplement it, but we can put it on Twitter. And sometimes we put our thoughts there and stuff about, for example, the new topic voting, which is, I think, going to be about housing. Uh, so that's there. So maybe give us a follow there as well. Oh, also, remember every now and then to read through the replies on our videos because people will ask about certain arguments and we do respond as best as we can to those. Yeah, we do have we do have some really good questions from you guys and we appreciate it. So, yeah, please feel free to do that. We try to answer as quickly as we can. Can't always do it immediately. We might like do a, a question of the month. Like, who was it that was like asking us? Somebody was oh. asking us like who when we were dropping the video. The answer is right. We're doing it now. We're doing <laughs> as so, fast as we possibly can. <laughs> okay, so um, on to the substance of it. Um, the resolution uh, resolved the United States should end its arms sales to Saudi Arabia. A few general thoughts from all three of us. My first thought is apparently somebody at NSDA is writing a thesis about arms sales because now we have the January February LD resolution, we have the February PF resolution, and now apparently next year's policy topic is they're all going to be about like arms sales to other countries. So this apparently is the is the big thing at NSDA. Uh, overall, I, I think it's a pretty good resolution. I mean, it's it's nice to kind of get out and have a pretty specific international topic to deal with. Law of the Sea was kind of big and unwieldy. Uh, this one is fairly specific, but it does take us to another part of the world. That's good. Uh, actually, when we started looking at it, I felt like this was going to be a pro-heavy resolution just because of the gut level, you know, problematic nature of Saudi Arabia's con uh, conduct with Jamal Khashoggi, with Yemen, and with some other countries in the region. I just, what I knew about it on that level made me think this is going to be pro-heavy. Now that I've read up on it, I actually think it leans more toward the con. And the reason for that is sort of the question of, of solvency, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, briefly, my thought is there's, there's no question that the things that Saudi Arabia are doing are kind of inimical to uh, U.S. interests and human rights and things like that they're very problematic but the question is uh, what uh, what solution we're gonna see from withdrawing all arms sales is this uh, doing too much is it too broad a brush to paint with uh, is it even gonna solve the problem at all are there better options and all of those are different angles I think that the con can take there are better options this won't solve the problem this overlooks the major contributions that Saudi Arabia's had over the years so I, I think it tilts a little bit toward the con I do think though it's a good resolution I think you're gonna have fun with it if it were you know for multiple months it would get a little old but I think for one month, it's it's good. It's pretty good. What do you guys think, Alicia? Well, the idea of it being a pro heavy, I mean, a con heavy topic, kind of relies on you having good opponents. Because if you're on a in a circuit where the people you're going against aren't that great, they're going to argue lives, 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 give yeah. you some really good pathos. And if they don't know to call you out on that being uh, something that's not solved by the resolution, you're not going to have like that good of a debate. But if you have really good debaters, it is going to be more con heavy. And the good thing about con is you just have so much you can say. You can run lots of arguments that people might not be anticipating or just different variations of them. Yeah, con can definitely, like one thing I like, I'll talk about this later, is the notion that, um, you know, you have multiple different paths to victory, I think. Multiple different ways where you can sort of take the exit and get off the highway before you get to where the pro wants to go. And we'll talk about that later, but I do think the con has the ability to do that. So Right. Um, one of the big things, kind of with every single topic, is it's going to be really helpful, uh, especially during cross-examination, to just know a good general history of the area. So, like, know the relationship between Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, and, like, the United States, Russia, way back during the Cold War. All of that has a chance of coming up again. 
Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit beforehand, but there's going to be on both sides this issue of solvency. Like, is what we're trying to do in this resolution actually going to solve a problem? In Yemen or with the issue of human rights or whatever right. you're talking about. Um, right? So be prepared for that. But I think one of the big things, and I think one of the reasons I'm probably going to agree with Brett on the idea that the con isn't necessarily easier to win, but there's a lot more on the con side, is that the con is going to look at this in a very like real world light. Like, look... This is what would happen if we did this, and this is why we don't need to do it, because we know it wouldn't work for X, Y, and Z reason. Yeah, I mean, uh, so two things. First of all, Josh, I agree with both of the things you said there. The first one was that you need to do general background reading. Um, you know, there, there are some issues where, you know, you might have sort of a gut-level understanding of what's going on. If you know something about NAFTA, you might not have had to read up on NAFTA. But with Saudi Arabia, unless you just happen to have some expertise on it, it's very easy to get confused on some of the background information. For example, the difference, the, the reason why, for example, there's a, a conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You know, the, different, the fact that Iran is a 90% Shia country and is seen as a Shia uh, Muslim power, and Saudi Arabia is seen as a 90% Muslim Sunni power, and the fact that you have two different religious factions and they sort of check each other in the region. If you're not familiar with the, how that works, you know, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And we're going to link to two uh, specific kind of long-form discussions of U.S.-Saudi relations. One comes from the Congressional Research Service in 2018. The other is from the Council on Foreign Relations. Neither one of them goes, I mean, well, they both actually have cards that you can pull from them that are great, right? Neither one, but, but both of them, I think, require you to kind of read them from beginning to end so that you have a general background understanding of what's going on. I think that the, the more you know, you know, and I'm sure that when, I, when we go edit this, there's going to be that, that graphic is going to be put in there, but the more you know, right, about the topic generally, uh, the better off you're going to be on this. Because there are going to be situations where if somebody has just a general misunderstanding of how something works and you can sort of generally correct them, you're going right. to make a really positive impression. Um, so with that, that's all I've got. It's a good topic. It's a fairly balanced topic, a little bit pen, uh, uh, swing toward the uh, toward the con. But with that, are you guys ready to do some definitions and framework? Yeah. Let's do some definitions and framework in just a second. All right, so we're back, and what we're going to do first is talk about some definitions and then some frameworks. So the first thing that stuck out to me, at least with our kind of debate, is the definition of end, because that's going to be the crux of your debate if you get off in the weeds of definitions. So what would you want to argue on the pro side? You, you have two choices. You could either argue that end doesn't have to be permanent, or you can stick with what the con is going to want you to say that an end is permanent and that you have to defend all grounds. I absolutely agree with that. I, I actually think the one unfortunate part of how this resolution is phrased is kind of the ambiguity of the term end. And I think that it is going to lead to some fights uh, and some disagreements on, on sort of the framing of whose territory or what territory belongs to who uh, when we're dealing with this. Um, because, you know, a, a common sense argument would be on this that uh, we're, we're probably not going to cease any arms sales to Saudi Arabia for the rest of time, right? Saudi Arabia has been a loyal ally of the United States for about 40 years. They assisted us heavily in the first Gulf War in the 1990s. There are a lot of things that we could cite that have been helpful to United States interests. It seems more likely that the goal of uh, of, of, of stopping arms sales for the time being would be that we would resume them at some point if Saudi Arabia complied with our wishes in terms of Yemen, in terms of human rights, in terms of things like that. But the term end, right, if we, if we look at what it means, if you look at the Macmillan definition, it just says to make something reach its final point, right? And if you look further at the examples from that definition, it says, it gives all these examples like the peace treaty ended the war, a back injury ended his career, I'd like to end my speech. In other words, bringing a permanent conclusion, right? And, you know, it, I understand that in PF debate, we don't, we try not to get too much into these definitional arguments. You, In many cases, in many circuits, you don't read definitions. You just go straight into your contentions. But what I think you may find yourself in, right, is a discussion about whether or not you know, it requires a permanent uh, cessation of sales to Saudi Arabia because the argument I think that the Khan would make, like you're saying, is, you know, if we permanently cease selling these arms to Saudi Arabia, well, number one, as we'll talk about later, they're going to go get them somewhere else. Russia and China already have indicated that they are able to and willing to, to sell them. It probably wouldn't be an immediate turnover, but that can happen. And then number two, we're just going to give away any leverage we might have had, right? So if we say 
we want to pause it, right, and we want to resume it when Saudi Arabia complies, is that an end? And I think that's a, a bit of an ambiguity that we're going to have to fight over, you know. Right. And one other thing uh, in terms of definitions is what exactly constitutes arms? Like, if you look up any definition, it's just going to be the long form word of armaments. But one thing that hopefully is going to be brought up at some point in the debate is the difference between, like, arms used purely for offense by a country versus things that we do across the world in places like South Korea or Japan, which is sell more so like defense capable armaments to prevent aggression against a country. Like if someone else was trying to fight Saudi Arabia, is that necessarily a bad thing that we would you know, want to get rid of? Yes. I think as a practical matter, most likely what most teams are going to use to define arms sales, whether again, whether they spell it out in an explicit definition or they just assume it, is going to be the Department of Defense's foreign military sales program. Because that's really where we, we send military equipment to Saudi Arabia, right? And the way this works is very straightforward. The United, you know, the United States goes and buys certain military equipment from U.S. defense contractors, and then it basically sells them over to allies and to selected countries, in this case to Saudi Arabia, uh, at cost, right? And uh, the problem is, you know, uh, that we sell as part of foreign military sales a bunch of different kinds of things, right? So, for example, if we're talking, we'll talk about this later, but if we're talking about Yemen, right? Uh, well, there clearly are some things like cluster bombs, like missiles, like attack helicopters, stuff like that, that we're using that are causing civilian casualties, right? But in that very same contract, you know, Donald Trump reached an agreement uh, in earlier in 2018 to, you know, sell uh, about a hundred billion dollars worth of arms to Saudi Arabia. In that very same contract, we have other things like cybersecurity, military communications upgrade, missile defense systems like Patriot missiles and THAAD missiles. Those of you who did the North Korea uh, topic a couple of years ago will remember that THAAD was a de purely defensive system designed to shoot down missiles. So one of the problems is if we're talking about all different forms of arms and all different forms of arms sales, well, to start with, does that include purely defensive stuff like the Patriot missile and THAAD, which have a totally legitimate purpose? Right. And, and we don't have a moral quandary selling those things to places like South Korea or Japan because they're necessary and they're purely defensive. And arguably the con would say we don't really, shouldn't really have a moral quandary about selling them to Saudi Arabia because you can't use a Patriot missile system or a THAAD missile system really to attack somebody else. They're purely defensive interceptor systems, right? And in a region where Iran is trying to develop ballistic nuclear missiles, I mean, we gave South Korea the THAAD system because their neighbor, North Korea, has ballistic missile nuclear capabilities. What in the world could be wrong with giving Saudi Arabia the same thing? So the con might come along and say, look, even if you think that some of these arms, the, 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 the offensive ballistic missiles, the bombs, things like that, are leading to human rights violations, the solution is not to end arms sales. We might tweak the deal and change what we sell. We might reduce arms sales only to have, for example, THADs and Patriot missiles and things like that. But ending it is ridiculous because some of these things, cybersecure, and, and that's another thing. I mean, I think that arms sales clearly has to include the defensive missile capabilities, right? It, whether it includes cybersecurity is a little more dicey as to whether that would count as arms. It is part of the deal. It is part of the current um, foreign military sales agreement between the United States. But even if you leave out the cybersecurity stuff, you've still got a whole bunch of stuff that we're selling that's mainly defensive and that Khan can just say, look, I, we're fine with scaling it back, reducing it, but ending it is going to deprive them of the ability to defend themselves against Iran. And that's that's there's no reason to do that. Why would we ever do that? You know, right. And I think that that is another sort of what is the definition of arms sales. And if you just go with it's whatever we're... It's, so if you just go with... It is whatever we're currently selling under the FMS foreign military sales, which I think a lot of teams do. That's fine. But if you're the pro, remember that you're saying, okay, now I've got to defend getting rid of cybersecurity, uh, uh, communications, and purely defensive missile capabilities, and probably some other things. And, you know, that's a pretty heavy burden. So you need to be very thoughtful about what you define arms as. I don't know that there's an easier way to do it, though, honestly. I don't know that there's a fair way for the pro to come in and say, oh, we're only talking about attack helicopters. I mean, that just doesn't seem legitimate. I think right. you kind of do have to do that. So, you know, that's what I've got on, on definitions. 
Um, again, whether or not you actually go in and have a, you know, sort of a lengthy definitions fight on these things is, is you may or may not, but you have to be aware of this. Yeah, stuff. I don't think that's really going to happen. I think the most thing you may be going to get is the definition of end, and that'll be a pretty quick argument if people are prepared so for it. I guess people do need to be prepared to respond if someone does run the <clears throat> argument that you have defensive weapons. I think yeah. you could argue framers' intent and say that the whole point that we're having this resolution is because people are actively dying in Yemen from offensive uses of these right. weapons. So that's what I would argue. It might not fly, but you have a lay judge. Use the pathos. You could probably win that argument. Well, the problem is the best argument for pulling back all of the all of the arms, right, is the leverage, right? Mm -hmm. You say, well, we understand that some of these things are defensive, but when we pull them back, the goal is for Saudi Arabia to change its behavior and then to get them back. But then you end up back on the question of what end means, right? And I do think that, you know, among better teams, you're going to circle back to that question of, you know, if we... You know, for example, if Congress passes a resolution and terminates the current agreement, the current FMS agreement, because Congress has to approve that, right? If they pass a resolution and say, we're, we're terminating our approval of that, but the, but the Trump administration immediately goes over and tries to yep. renegotiate a new agreement, right, which they will. They right. absolutely will. They'll jump on the jet, go over there and try to renegotiate a new agreement that includes some kind of restrictions for Yemen, some kind of restrictions on human rights. Is that an end? I mean, that sounds a lot like the United States federal government doing more like a pause, well, right? Well, the other thing is, as the con, I would say, look, you're leveraging these defensive missile capabilities purely for political leverage. You're putting people's lives at risk just as some sort of pawn in a political game. That'd be a pretty strong argument against the pathos the uh, pro will probably bring up at some point in their case. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. So um, anyway, long story short, I, I don't think there's quite as much here to do in terms of framework, definitely, but there are two framework fights, but I think there are two that are important. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of good clear-cut answers on them, but you do need to be aware of them. Okay, well with that, then we will uh, take a look then at some of the arguments uh, for the pro coming up uh, right now. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the pro. And the pro, I think, does have a bit of an uphill battle on a couple of fronts, but there are ways around it, and we're going to talk for a few minutes about how to do that. Uh, you know, the first and biggest issue to talk about with the pro in terms of impact, in terms of the harms of the status quo, is obviously going to be uh, the conflict in Yemen, right? <laughs> Uh, Yemen is a is one of the great sort of unsung, unreported on humanitarian conflicts in the world today, and there is abundant evidence that the arms that the United States is providing to Saudi Arabia are helping to fuel, or arguably just straight up fueling, uh, this conflict in which many, many civilians are being displaced, they're starving, they're on the verge of famine, they're being killed. There are numerous stories about that. I think, Alicia, you've looked at some of this stuff just to talk about what the harms and the impacts would be. Right, so if you want one of the best sources out there on this, Bloomberg in October 2018 has this primer about all the ways that things are going wrong in Yemen. And if you want some really good statistics on death tolls, they even have it narrowed down to which airstrikes were on legitimate targets and which ones were on not. So it's, it if, looks real bad. If you're running the pathos <laughs> argument, you're going to want to talk about bombing marketplaces and bombing hospitals and school buses Schools, full of children. Yeah. And oh, talk all of about, which, by the way, remember, are war crimes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All of this is illegal. The phrase war crimes, the, the phrase U.S. weapons are being used to commit <laughs> war crimes right now is a good phrase to but use, But more right? importantly, you could talk about how two-thirds of the country is food insecure. 85,000 children have already died from extreme hunger. 2.3 million been And displaced. a lot of this is to do yeah. directly with Saudi Arabia blockading the port that's responsible for 80% of their food imports. Yemen's not exactly the place where you grow your food, so you have to import it, and Saudi Arabia is specifically cutting off that food supply. And that's why they've had a major cholera outbreak. It's just bad in Yemen. It's just bad. There's no I, other way to put it. And we it's should, we should, we actually shouldn't make a lot of it. It is a genuine humanitarian tragedy. But the point is, I don't think we need to spend, you know, uh, a half an hour sitting here listing all of the harms in Yemen or really trying to sort of lay out all the evidence that U.S. arms are causing. not going it. to argue against that. Yeah, right. nobody's going to say that Yemen's a good situation. And really, I don't think anybody's going to say that Saudi Arabia or U.S. arms, because we're their, overwhelmingly their major source of arms, that, that, that we're not fueling it. We are. Right. So right. The problem, I, the problem run, is, yeah, go ahead. The problem you <laughs> run into as the pro is how are you going to prove that ending arms sales to Saudi Arabia, whether you buy into the short term definition of end or the forever definition, how is that going to fix the situation in Yemen? Solvency, basically. What's the solvency? How, do, how, does, how does ending arms sales solve the problem in Yemen? And there's a there's a big issue there, right? Because there is abundant evidence out there, and and even Trump himself is arguing this that you know it, it, it's sort of a common sense matter. 
if we end all arms sales to Saudi Arabia, and by end, I mean sort of the con definition of end, meaning we'll never do it again. We're done with you guys. You know, we take our ball and go home. There is a 0% chance that Saudi Arabia will do anything other than go to China, go to Russia, go to European nations, go to anybody it can, and buy arms from them. They have no choice because they don't have the capacity to make their own. Of course they're going to go and buy their arms. Further, and there, by the way, there is, there is counter evidence to that that says this would take time, right? In other words, these systems that they bought from the United States are not interoperable with Chinese or Russian weapons. It would take time for them to buy it. Fine. Fair enough. But the I, fact is, it's probably still but, eventually going to happen. But they have no choice. Like, if I if I prefer Irish Spring Soap and they stop making Irish Spring Soap or they have, like, an embargo where they won't sell Irish Spring Soap to me personally, I'm going to have to go buy something else. So there's a 100% chance they're going to go get it from somewhere else. And there's evidence that it's not quite as good. Fair enough, but it's good enough to kill civilians. Right. right? Chinese weapons are more than sufficient to kill a whole bunch of civilians. There's no question right. about that. So they're going to go and do that. So if this goes back to the definition thing. Right. Right. And so the idea is, all right, if it's an absolute non-starter that we can't just end it forever, clearly we're going to have to end the current system or the current deal that we have in place now. It's going to be essential if you're on the pro and really going to have a chance of winning this that we're talking about the current deal. And what that is, is a deal that uh, Trump signed back in what, like 2017? March 2017. Yeah. March 2017 that described $110 billion worth of armaments now and $350 billion over the next 10 years. And now because this is pretty much the way things work, like we deal with contractors, we deal with suppliers. There's a very strong argument with the idea that ending means just ending this contract and at some point going back to the negotiating table and starting a new one. I think that is exactly right. And let me just echo and amplify how important it is for the pro to win this, right? If we just say we're done and we walk away, then there's a 100% chance that Saudi Arabia is going to go buy arms from other folks. Further, it's it's not even going to be able to slow down in Yemen because it's not like Saudi Arabia is on its last five missiles or its last, you know, last few tank parts. They've got a functioning military. They can continue and will continue to operate in Yemen for any interim in which we're not selling them weapons. They have the weapons. They have the ability to use them. And in the time that they're using the last of the U.S. supply, they're going to be turning around and going to other sources because they literally have no choice, right? Um, and so if that's the case, then I think it is absolutely imperative, as Josh said, that in terms of framing the resolution, you have to win the idea as the pro that end in the resolution means ending the current deal. And this goes to sort of the way in like the real world that these arms deals work. Like in the real world, the way we do foreign military sales, FMS, is we don't like have a constant supply where it's just going all the time. We make specific deals. We enter into specific like contractual agreements or diplomatic agreements like the one Trump entered into for $110 billion with Saudi Arabia in 2017. So what the pro needs to argue is that when we say end as a term of art within the specific world of foreign military sales, what that means is end the current deal. Because if you do that, what it means is then we can go back to the negotiating table. We say, look, we're going to take away the arms and we're going to go back to the negotiating table and we're going to negotiate with you, Saudi Arabia, to change your behavior in Yemen, to not target civilians. We're going to negotiate with you to change your behavior, to not target journalists like Jamal Khashoggi and things like that. And the, there, in that case, the argument will be this is the best way for us to change your behavior. Because if we just completely walk away and take it away forever, we can't change your behavior. And the analogy I use is, you know, I have a son who's 14 years old, right? And if I go and I say, look, you've been behaving badly, right? You you were behaved badly at your grandmother's last week. I'm taking away the PlayStation, right? Well, if I take away the PlayStation uh, and, uh, and I just take a hammer to it and I just bash it and break it, I have no leverage with him anymore. He's not getting the PlayStation back, right? There's a 0% chance that he's going to change his behavior in response to wanting the PlayStation, right? On the other hand, if I take away the PlayStation and put it up in the closet, then there is a non-zero chance that he'll change his behavior. And that's sort of what the pro is arguing. The pro is saying, look, you know, it's not certain that Saudi Arabia will change its behavior, but we, we 
with if we don't take away these arms, which are our only real negotiating tactic with them, by the way, because our like our domestic aid, our non-military aid to Saudi Arabia is like it's pitiful. It's like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. It's nothing, right? So this is our only leverage. If we don't take it away from them, we literally have nothing to encourage them with. We have no leverage. And there's a there's a very nice functioning PlayStation right down the road that he'd be happy to go. Yeah, play exactly. With. If we do take it away from them, right <laughs> in the short term, you know, if we do take it away from them, there is some non-zero chance that they will come to the bargaining table and say, you know what, we really like your weapons. They're better than the ones with China. And if we were to go to China, it would take us years to get all this new stuff. Fair enough. We're willing to not kill civilians in Yemen. But in order for that to happen, the pro has to win the idea that ending the current deal is sufficient to end and then we go back to the negotiating table and we get them to do what they want. It's a little bit involved. It's a little complicated. I don't see another way that the pro can make a solvency argument, you know? Right. And the other big thing is there's benefits on both sides too because one of the big things that we're going to bring up uh, is potentially just as, a, just as a squirrel is the idea that if the U.S. can keep being the ones that's supplying arms, we can prevent Saudi Arabia's like nuclear proliferation because they've already expressed interest to develop their own nuclear weapons, especially as a response to Iran. And the only reason they haven't is because the United States is in contractual agreements with them and we're basically acting as their nuclear umbrella. So by keeping inside certain deals and having a different deal go forward, we prevent them from having their own nuclear weapons and we prevent even more nukes coming into the world. Right. And we definitely have solvency on Saudi Arabia getting weapons because we see the South Korea has been supplying them with nuclear reactors in the past two or three years. They have enrichment capabilities for those reactors, but more importantly, they have a relationship with Pakistan, which is a nuclear power, essentially saying, whenever you need it, we will transfer this technology to you. Dude, Saudi you want to start dropping nukes? We are there. We will hook you up. <laughs> you join the club, right? Um, yeah, I, I think on a related note to that, there's actually a pretty good argument that... Um, Again, this goes back to winning the idea that ending means ending the current deal, like the 2017 deal. But if you if you if you prove that and you show the judge that that's all you have to do to win, uh, there's actually arguments that the current deal contains provisions that are really antithetical to U.S. interests. Specifically, the current deal contains provisions uh, that will help Saudi Arabia develop its own capacity to build weapons. I don't know why in the world we agreed to this <laughs> with a country that we know know is belligerent, that we know goes around and, and kills innocent people, but the current deal, the 2017 deal, actually contains $6 billion worth of, of Lockheed Martin going to Saudi Arabia and helping them set up their own capacity to build weapons, right? And uh, the, the, the crown prince, uh, Ben Salman, over in Saudi Arabia has made it very clear that their new highest defense priority is within a decade or so to start building their own defense industry, their own capacity to build weapons. So one thing you could argue is kind of a squirrel would be, look, even if you think that as a broad matter, selling uh, arms to Saudi Arabia is okay, that it's not bad, we should still end the current deal because the current deal is basically teaching them how to make their own bombs, right? And it, it would be much better if we kept them sort of on a we don't want to do that, right? right? We should keep them on a short leash because we've seen the things that they do in Yemen. We've seen the things that they do with their journalists, right? So what we need to do is we need to end the current deal and we can go back and renegotiate another deal that does not send Lockheed Martin over to Saudi Arabia <laughs> to teach them how to make their own bombs so they don't need us anymore and can do whatever they want. Right. It's, you know. So and as a really this is, quick like yeah, yeah. caveat to that, someone on the con is going to run the idea that if we shut down arms sales, we're going to be losing jobs. But this is what your response as the pro would be. You would say, no, if you've read the deal, the deal specifically says those jobs will be created in Saudi Arabia. Anybody saying that jobs will be built up in the United States is lying to you. Also, I mean, there, also, there, are, there are a certain number of jobs in the defense industry. Thousands, that, that maybe. We're, yeah, I, I do think you need to be ready with a block as the pro on this jobs issue. I think the weight of the evidence and the weight of the literature is that the net number of jobs created by this deal with Saudi Arabia is pretty small. Because remember, with all due respect, we're talking about numbers that start with a B in billions, right? And we're talking about, you know, maybe a hundred billion sounds like a lot, but remember the United States budget every year is four trillion dollars. It's four thousand million dollars. So a billion sounds like a lot of money, but in terms of the net impact on U.S. employment, the argument would be it, you know, it sounds like a lot, but it's really not that much, right? Well, also the other argument is, okay, we're creating, you know, a couple thousand jobs at the cost of several tens of thousands of civilian lives yeah. if we continue doing what we're doing right now. 
Um, <laughs> you don't want to get into a fight in front of a lay judge where you're, I mean, jobs are important, yes, but you really, you know, I've seen some folks who are writing about this. It's like, this is going to be a debate about lives versus jobs. Well, let me just give you a quick FYI. In front of 99% of all human beings, anybody who's not like a hardcore, you know, debate person. Or psychopath. Or psychopath, or, you know, because they kind of overlap like the Venn diagram, <laughs> right? But anybody who's not a psychopath or like a hardcore policy debater, lives are going to win that, right? Lives are going to win over jobs. So if you're thinking we're going to go in and we're going to make this jobs versus lives and we're going to slug it out and win, you're not, right? right? You're just not. So, so one last point. You may be thinking, what do I do if I don't win this definitions debate? There are some judges who lose. will not be convinced. No. <laughs> what we need to do at that point is I would almost suggest having two cases. The case that you run under the best terms, assuming you win the definitions debate, and the backup case. The backup case where you say that arm sales generally are harmful. They cause more deaths. They cause more instability. Meddling in the Middle East at all causes instability. Picking yeah. a side in a disagreement between yeah. Iran and Saudi Arabia causes instability. Yeah. There's lots of anecdotal evidence. There's lots of empirical evidence. So, uh, we'll drop some of those in the comments. Actually, yes, this is true. Like it, This is also mentioned in the uh, video we did on the LD topic on military aid generally. Um, but you know, if you have LD debaters on your team, and I'm sure most of you do, um, you should s just just uh, unabashedly steal all their stuff because they've been debating a very similar resolution to this. And I'm sure if, if you haven't already stolen their stuff, why have you not stolen their stuff? <laughs> I mean, you should absolutely be using it. But there's a lot of good sort of general evidence out there that is not Saudi Arabia specific, but it's about how like U.S. military aid and arms sales generally are bad. And you know, you can you can kind of sort of you know catch some con teams off guard if you say look I, I'm not even I mean you could maybe have a contention or two about Saudi Arabia specifically but you might have another that just talks about how look even if you think that we can't fix all the problems in Saudi Arabia um, military uh, aid generally and arms sales in particular are bad right they cause a lot of problems and so for example some of the evidence that we had in the LD video was there's this Solomon and Tessman piece from 2011 that says, look, the whole point of this military aid that we do and these arms sales that we do is the idea that they're going to encourage these uh, these countries to do to cooperate with the United States and to go along with our interests. But there is a strong evidence that it actually does the opposite, right? That that military arms sales um, uh, that arms sales do the opposite. The countries that receive large amounts of it actually are less likely to cooperate with the United States, uh, more likely to pursue their own interest. And we'll put some links in there about why that's the case. And there's even better evidence from the Rand Corporation in 2014 that says, you know, it's uniquely ineffective for authoritarian regimes. Like, so even if these sales work well with maybe democracies and things like that, they're uniquely bad at changing the behavior uh, and encouraging cooperation from authoritarian regimes. And of course, right, of course, Saudi Arabia is an authoritarian regime. So you can kind of get a little more general and say, look, you know, unfortunately, all that we can talk about in this particular round is Saudi Arabia. But I'm going to show you why, as just a general matter, the, the arms sales are bad. They're negative. They don't serve United States interests. And so for just that general reason, we should be getting rid of them wherever we can. And let's go ahead and start with Saudi Arabia right. and do, you know. So. If right. you want a slam dunk statistic linking the dollars that we spend <laughs> to deaths. This is from a last name that I cannot it's, pronounce. I, it took me a while. Omolacheva. 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 Omolacheva in 2017 finds that for every dollar we spend, we get 0 .06 more deaths. So that means $1,000 is 60 deaths. One million dollars is sixty thousand. And this is a three hundred and fifty billion dollar deal. And, and so at some point, you know, there's going to be a diminishing return. I don't think we're going to go in there and argue that you're going to lead to a billion deaths or whatever. <laughs> but but at the end of the day, yes, Amalacheva was a strong card in LD, and it basically says that military aid and foreign military spending, of course, is a form of military aid. It's clearly within the definition of military aid. But what it says is that for every dollar we spend, like Alicia said, we're increasing. The, the more we spend on military aid, the more people die. Right. And so if you just want to have a nice generic backstop thing for folks who are not, you know, just to get away from the Saudi Arabia, Yemen specific stuff, the Jamal Khashoggi specific stuff, just say, look, uh, there's this 2017 study. It's this great regression analysis with this really well done analysis. And, it, you know, it says that we just every time we spend another dollar on this nonsense, more people die. We should stop. And, and unfortunately, Judge, you don't have the power to vote all military aid away, but you do have the power to vote several billion, hundreds of billions of dollars of it in a particularly violent country away so why don't we start there you know let's let's start reducing this death money right by taking some of it away from saudi arabia 
Um, and I think it's a real nice card. It is a little bit more germane to the LD topic because that's about military aid generally, but I think you can use it here, um, and I think it's a, it's a nice little weapon to have in your arsenal. So, right. And this kind of goes back to an analogy you were talking about earlier. It's like if you're looking to buy, say, a basketball shoe, and you're thinking, okay, cool, if I buy this shoe, it'll make me better at basketball, right? Our arms sales are supposed to have some sort of like compliance with this country, yeah. but it was made by sweatshop labor, and it also makes you worse at basketball, you probably shouldn't buy those shoes, except replace sweatshop labor with war crimes yeah. and a basketball shoe with billions of dollars worth of weapons. I mean, yeah, basically what, <laughs> yeah, what Josh is saying is like, yeah, you'd be conflict. I think I said this in the other video, but like you might be conflicted and say, oh, well, this basketball shoe is going to make me better, but it was like it was made in a sweatshop. But then if you find out it actually doesn't make you better, <laughs> it makes you worse. And that's what the, the Sullivan evidence says, is that this makes these countries less cooperative. Well, you know, like we said before, moral quandary solved, right? <laughs> If it's not going to encourage the country to behave properly, and it seems that it's not, right? Clearly, it's not doing it currently with Saudi Arabia, right? Saudi Arabia clearly feels like it has license to go murder journalists that are actually, you know, residents who have been residents of the United States. Clearly, they feel like they can blow up school buses full of children. So how how's that... Uh, and how's that leverage working out for you, right? It clearly hasn't worked out. The Sullivan evidence that we're going to show you says it doesn't work generally. So it's it's the shoe's not going to make you a better basketball player. The aid's not going to make these countries more cooperative. So, you know, why do it to begin with, right? And then, as you say, the downside is not sweatshop labor. It's just a whole lot of deaths. <laughs> and so I, I think you can have kind of a nice mixture of, on the one hand, I mean, you could do two separate cases, or you can kind of hedge your bets and have a little bit about Saudi Arabia and Yemen specifically, and then maybe on the back end of contention that just talks about how this aid is crap, it doesn't work, and it kills people as a sort of a generic matter. But I do think that gives the the uh, the uh, pro some options. Last thing I was thinking about on the pro is um, you know, maybe a general argument that sort of uh, a, a kind of major impact link turn uh, in the sense that you know the big assumption that all cons are going to want to make is that our ability to go in and and have influence in the Middle East is a good thing, right? right. We, we, we need, need to, soft power. We need to have soft power. We need to go in and be able to influence these countries and check the Irans of the world and, 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 and those sorts of things. You know, there, there might be, and I don't know if I have enough time to talk about it in this particular video, but I might try to drop some links. There might be sort of a, a really kind of abstract argument that just look at the historical record of the United States soft power and the United States intervention in the Middle East. It's been an unmitigated, just been one unmitigated disaster after another. So even if you think that you know, this uh, this military aid and these arms sales are going to give us greater influence over these countries. Look what our influence has wrought, right? Our influence has been a disaster. And a pro would say, you know, the con would say, well, it would be worse if, you know, ISIS took over the whole thing. It was like, ISIS is not going to take over the whole yeah. thing. Like, part of the reason ISIS and these other groups like the Taliban exist is because, you know, we went in and started arming them to begin with, you know, back in the 1980s. I mean, you had the Mujahideen fighting the Soviets back in the early 80s. We gave them a bunch of rocket launchers and you know, 20 years later, they're the Taliban. So one big high level argument, if you really wanted to get kind of abstract about it, would be the United States just needs to completely back off of trying to influence Middle Eastern countries, period, because our record in that region has been absolutely atrocious, has right. resulted in countless deaths. We just need to back off entirely. And there's support and evidence from both sides of the aisle, and that's pretty extensive on that as well. So anyway, um, I think the con, as we said, or excuse me, the pro, I think the pro has a bit of an uphill battle in terms of solvency. The basic idea is you need to win this idea that ending means ending the current agreement because otherwise you're just sort of throwing up your hands and walking away and there's a 100% chance that Saudi Arabia is going to go and get arms from somewhere else, at least eventually, right? They have to. But if you win that ending means the current agreement, then what you say is in the pro world, there is a, in the con world where we don't pull the agreement, we have zero leverage. There is a 0% chance that Saudi Arabia changes its behavior. And even if you don't necessarily think that removing uh, arms sales, you know, this current agreement is 100% likely to change their behavior, at least you have some non-zero chance, right. right? You have some positive chance of having the leverage to get them to change their behavior domestically and abroad. And something is better than nothing. It's, it's better to take the PlayStation away and try to change your son's behavior rather than just to let your little brat sit there and glibly play it. And, and probably get worse. And, and not do anything. Anything about it and probably become a worse person. So you, you might as well try because there's a positive chance that it will right. accomplish something. Uh, anything else on the pro? I think, I That's think, it. I think okay. we're going to con. And now we're going to have some fun because there's a lot of stuff in the con <laughs> which we will get to when we get back in just one second. 
Okay, so let's talk about the con. And I think the con's, you know, sort of biggest single advantage is taking it is is taking advantage of the pros' biggest disadvantage to say the same thing several ways. Um, but basically, the idea that. Um, solvency, right? That taking away weapons is not going to solve the problem in Yemen, but to understand and to under, and to solve the other problems in terms of Saudi Arabia's behavior. But to understand that, I think it is very important to have some context about what exactly the, con uh, the, the conflict in Yemen is, right? Because it's very easy from the outside looking in to say, oh, well, there's this fight and all of these civilians have died and there's food insecurity and it's really bad and Saudi Arabia is using U.S. weapons, therefore they must be the bad guy and this must be an unjust uh, war. But you need to remember there's another side to the story, right? The United States has endorsed uh, the coalition's involvement in Yemen and their military strikes in Yemen. And the reason is, you know, um, Yemen is a conflict in which Saudi Arabia's next door neighbor has seen its government overthrown by a militia movement, the Houthi rebels, right, that is backed and armed, and that's important, armed by its, uh, its chief rival, Iran, right? And so what it's looking at is the, the specter of having its next door neighbor effectively taken over by a military coup from an extremely violent uh, rebel movement that's funded by its, its, its worst enemy, it's, in essence, in Iran. It would be sort of like if the United States looked up and saw that Canada, you know, large parts of Canada had been overrun by sort of Russian-backed separatist forces. And not only had they overrun Canada, but they were actually shooting missiles across the border into the United States, into New York, into Boston, and places like that, because that's what's going on, right? Saudi Arabia is being attacked, cross-border rocket attacks, missile attacks, civilians, Saudi civilians have been killed by attacks from these from these Houthi rebels, right? right? And it might be worth throwing in a few impacts here and there about how the Houthi rebels like are committing war crimes and killing civilians too. Because we try to demonize Saudi Arabia, but there's two sides to this. Right. The Houthi rebels, you know, uh, are doing what a lot of insurgents do. It's a common sort of guerrilla warfare strategy, which is they're hiding among civilian populations. I mean, if we're going to be fair, it is clear that Saudi Arabia has done some really negligent, arguably malicious things in terms of blowing up civilians. But, you know, one of the reasons that they would say this is going on is because like a lot of insurgents, these rebels hide among civilian populations. That's what they do. They set up shop in places that are heavy. They don't go set up, you know, remote military enclaves because they know that they can't win a stand up fight, right? A lot of insurgencies know that. And so they hide among civilians, right? And so if you just sort of say, well, there's bloodshed and violence going on and we can't be part of that and we've got to withdraw, you know, one argument might be that that actually creates a really perverse incentive. Right? It says to rebel movements around the world, look, all you've got to do to break the United States will to fight or to support its allies is just go and have the bloodiest, most atrocious, you know, starvation, civilians being blown Public up. Public beheadings. Well, you just just make it the worst possible thing you can. Hide among civilians so that your opponents have to attack. Or maybe they have to is not fair. They don't have to. But that they're likely to attack you there and civilians are right. likely to die. And the more blood and the more chaos and the more destruction you do, eventually the United States is going to tire of it and they're going to withdraw and you can win. So one argument would be is these folks are committing war crimes themselves, the Houthi rebels. And if we just go in and unilaterally disarm the Saudis, even though their hands are not perfectly clean. We know they're not perfectly clean, but if we withdraw, if we unilaterally disarm them, we're sending a message that oh, all you got to do is make it the most carnage and bloodshed you possibly can, and you're more likely to win that. Well, the other impact you have there is if you destabilize Saudi Arabia, or if you even convince them to pull out of the war in Yemen, what you're doing is you're leaving those citizens at the mercy of the Houthi rebels yes. who are committing these heinous crimes, and they're going to have absolutely no recourse against them. So ultimately, you'll have more lives lost in that scenario well, the other than thing if you is, let the war just play out. Remember, they don't even necessarily have absolutely no recourse against it. Like Brett was saying earlier, they have their own military, but what they're going to say is, okay, well, we can no longer use American weapons. We'll just have to keep pressing on this fight against the Houthis and then go on and use Russian or Chinese weapons yeah. that are either going to be worse or more expensive. And the same thing still happens. Right. Nothing's changing. Yeah, and we'll get to that. I think one thing I wanted to say is kind of an overview on that. And we talked about this in the LD video, which is basically the same topic, is, you know, one of the themes I think that the con is going to want to have is we have to be adults here. We have to be grown-ups here. And in the real world, 
the United States, anybody, if you want to, to solve serious conflicts and maintain peace, sometimes you may have to make deals with people who aren't so nice. I don't think it behooves the Khan at all to deny that Saudi Arabia does bad things. I think you should come in and straight up say, yeah, absolutely, we know. Saudi Arabia's done some really bad stuff. We do not in any way endorse the Khashoggi situation. It was bad. They need to have some consequences. Uh, this is just not the right way to do it. And, and the analogy that I used in the other video was the idea of the United States supporting Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union right. before we entered World War II, right? We had a thing called the Lend-Lease Act where we were selling, uh, or, or in some cases just giving, right, uh, thousands of planes and tanks and ammunition and all kinds of things. We even built a statue of it up in Alaska of us giving, you know, this aid to the Soviet Union. And remember, the Soviet Union under Stalin was barbaric in a way that would put Saudi Arabia to shame. I mean, Joseph Stalin murdered tens of millions of his own people who were his political opponents or suspected of being that. It was one of the most, it, it, you know, arguably he even killed more people than Hitler. But the thing is, he wasn't trying to take over all of Europe. And Hitler was, right? So we saw a situation where we had to work with a bad guy, a person we knew was a bad guy. And that's just something we have to do sometimes. Sure. And, and the Khan would say, we don't have anything against... Their there being some consequences and condemnation of Saudi Arabia, but unilaterally disarming them in the middle of a gunfight with this barbaric, you know, and that may be not the right word, but this group that is murdering civilians and trying to take over their next door neighbor that's already overthrown a legitimate government, right, is not the way to do it. We need to think of another way. This is not the correct approach to take, right? Right. Or if you want to think about something else, you could make the argument that a lot of people do at the domestic gun debate. You could argue that it's not the arms sales that's the problem, but the way that they're being used and the way that the United States is facilitating the war. Because right now, one of the things we're doing is providing advice at their border. We're providing them with aerial refueling. We're giving them intelligence. So essentially, we are the ones fueling this war. We're giving them an advantage. Yes. They've and had the weapons for years and haven't used them. Yeah, I mean, you could actually make a good point on this, which is that, you know, they exactly as you say, Alicia, they've had these weapons for a long time. And to be honest with you, they, you know, they haven't, you know, honestly, they haven't been involved in as many wars in the Middle East as we have. Right. Um, but the difference is we're going in and we're providing them with specific logistical aid, or at least we have been. And there's some consideration now in Congress about whether to end that. And by the way, I need to say this. I should have said this sooner. This is an evolving day to day topic. Right. This is something where like just the day before we started this, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, Congress passed a bill that may change the debate a little bit on the 23rd of January. And as you go through this month, this is going to be a hot topic. Congress is looking at this. You may have some opportunities to Google stories and Google things the day before the tournament or the morning of the tournament that give you an advantage. So right. this is one of those resolutions where if you're using stuff from this video, which was shot a week before the beginning of January, it's some good stuff to start with. But if you're not Googling... I mean, now you could just be Googling it in the middle of the round and something may come up yeah. during the round. Right. With, the, with the new rules in some <laughs> districts, yeah, you can, you can actually use the internet in some rounds. But but the truth is you, you have to keep up with what's going on. But that said, you know, we are providing logistical aid, air, mid-air refueling of aircrafts, intelligence guidance, you know, to these forces about where to strike. You know, one, one piece of leverage that we might instead use would be to say, look, you know, you're relying on us to some extent for intelligence about where to strike. We're only going to give you intelligence when we feel confident that you couldn't possibly blow up civilians. Right. I mean, the United States can limit or curtail or otherwise modify how it assists Saudi Arabia. It can say, look, you want to fly your uh, you want to fly your your attack planes. Well, we're not going to refuel them if they're going on a route that we think would take them too close to civilian populations. Right. There are a lot of different options that we have that don't involve us necessarily taking away all their weapons. And and that's another thing that we talked about earlier, which is, you know, I think one thing the con ought to be arguing is that when we say end arms sales, the only fair way to interpret that judge, right, is to say, we're not selling you anything that's under the current uh, uh, foreign military sales uh, agreement. And that means that we're not just taking away attack helicopters and cluster bombs and things like that that do kill civil, uh, civilians, right? What we're also taking away is uh, uh, counter uh, cyber terrorism equipment, communications equipment, and most importantly, purely defensive tools like the Patriot missile system and like the Thad missile system, whose only job is to intercept incoming missiles, which is, is something that is currently happening. Right. The Houthi militias are shooting these missiles into Saudi Arabia. And so 
Judge, you know, if you, we would be all in favor of, say, for example, an alternative of we should restrict sales, we should right. lessen sales, we should re, we should rethink certain parts of the deal, but ending is not okay because ending takes away totally legitimate stuff. Right. Well, and that's, that's like, sorry. Well, that, that's the big thing. It's like if you can especially win the argument on framework that end means wholesale forever, you could actually turn that into like pretty much a turn where you could say, listen, if we get rid of these defensive capabilities, we could have a possibility of even greater death tolls of civilians by militants, by people attacking Saudi Arabia, not just like Houthi rebels, but if Iran decided to actually come in and invade or really target uh, Saudi Arabia, we could see way more civilian deaths than we're seeing right now. I mean, I, I guess I don't understand why, like, you know, if you're in the middle of a gunfight, you think the solution is to go pick one of the participants in the gunfight and take away their gun, right? That that doesn't end the gunfight. Well, like in New Vegas, if you holster your weapon, there's a chance the other guy will too, but got, it will never happen. We got a, cl- we got a New Vegas reference, which which. <laughs> So a lot of you guys, you got you you oh like God. you four, may have been like just yeah. These guys are like they may out. have like fourteen and fifteen year olds <laughs> watching. Some of you guys like to this. We might as well be talking about Pac Man, <laughs> New Vegas. It's a classic. Take a look at it if you haven't. But yeah, yeah I, I mean, know, you're right. It's not a solution to just take away the the guns, you know, for one party. One other thing I wanted to mention for the negative, and this goes back to excuse me the con, uh, but w- this goes back to this idea that you should be keeping up with this event day to day, right? This is something you should be googling every day. Is it sometimes in public forum because it is an event that is driven by current events you have an opportunity to kind of uh, out recent your opponent to out current your opponent with like something that happened today and it, it seems a little cheesy but I mean honestly I think it's a legitimate tactic and so let me give you an example of how this might work right now okay so um, currently uh, there's an article from the uh, I don't well I have to take a look at what the source is but there's an article from the IRIN news network about how currently there are discussions going on about a ceasefire in the northern port city of Hodida I think that's how you say it right and th- there is an article that says that uh, f- folks in Saudi Arabia and authorities there think that there is a real chance that this could be right the best opportunity we have to find a diplomatic solution right but if we were to withdraw our military support for Saudi Arabia like today like in this round like if we were having a round right now right well they would obviously lose all credibility because the only reason that the that the Houthis are negotiating with them at all is they think they might lose right so if the United States withdraws its military support today then we are effectively undercutting this sort of what we would say is kind of this last best effort right and there might be another last best effort in the beginning of February or the second week of February. So one thing you might do is be on the lookout for like diplomatic overtures that are going on and you can make an argument that runs like this. Judge, look, maybe you think that it would be a good idea to withdraw these arms, but we shouldn't do it tonight at this debate round. There's currently, as we speak right now, diplomatic negotiations going on about that might that, that experts believe, according to this article, and we'll drop this article in the notes, might reach a diplomatic solution. But if we cut and run now, and if we pull our support now, then obviously there's no reason for the for the Houthis to negotiate at all. So let's give it a chance, and you know, if in two or three days uh, it turns out that it doesn't work, <laughs> then then you can go ahead and vote pro. Of, of course, you will have turned in your ballot by then, right? right? So there, there is the opportunity to kind of out current people with the latest, greatest breaking news about what's going. Going on. And another way is to counter like a source. If it came in from January and you've got a source from February, be like, look, judge, you know, maybe a month ago I would have agreed with my opponent, but the fact is that source is a month old and a lot has changed. In fact, a source from, you know, last week says that, yeah. you know, da 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 da. Like, like on, and on some of these things, it doesn't matter so much. Like the evidence that we talked about earlier about how, like, this aid just doesn't work. I don't think it has to necessarily be super right. current. But if it's about this specific situation in Yemen in particular, uh, I do think that recency matters. Another thing we're recency matters is just yesterday, uh, yesterday being January 23rd, uh, the House and Senate approved a new military aid bill that would cut off international military education and training to Saudi Arabia, but not the arms sales. And the idea would be that if we aren't training them on how to use these arms, you know, it, it won't necessarily undercut their ability to fight the war right now, but over the long run, it will undercut them. So one thing you could say is, Judge, look, we just put into place this other measure, which is withdrawing training as opposed to withdrawing arms let's give it a chance to work right we just did that last week why don't we see if this works why don't we give it a few weeks give it a month and see if the thing that congress just did works right there's no real reason not to right and look if in a month it hasn't worked fine we can come back you know after this topic is over which is a little disingenuous we could come
come back and then then you can you know call us up on our cell phones and tell us you would have voted the other way but like for now we just put into place this other solution why don't we try and see if it can work right so these kind of like more recent more current arguments i think are you know sort of a strong way to to approach the problem right mm -hmm. But really, like the best argument you have as the negative or the con is to say that we need to have the option for arms sales as a negotiating piece, like yeah. for leverage. And actually, if you want something that's kind of an ironic piece of evidence, this is from NBC News. The Human Rights Watch Yemen researcher, uh, Christine Berkeley, said that the way that we should end this fight is by using the arms sales as a leverage. <laughs> like this is a human rights researcher in, in who is acknowledging <laughs> that we have to have these weapons, that the arms sales are going to continue regardless of who they're from. So we might as well use them for some good. Right. right. And this, well, this, and again, it keeps coming back to the definition of exactly what we mean by end, right? And just like we talked about earlier, how the pro needs to be pretty aggressive. I think the con needs to be pretty aggressive in staking out its territory, right? Where you say, look, end means end. Right. The people who wrote this resolution could have said pause. They could have said attach conditions to. They could have said condition arm sales. There were a hundred different ways they could have written this resolution. But what they wrote is end. Right. And I'm sorry, but if you go and, you know, stop doing something with the full intention in a few months with a few tweaks that you'll resume it, there's no way in the English language that we refer to that as end. If I am smoking and I say I'm going to not smoke for a month, but I, I'm pretty sure I'll be smoking again in a month or two, I have, <laughs> not, stop smoking. I have not ended my smoking. That's not what it means. And I think the, the, the con needs to take a hard line and say, look, all this negotiation stuff, pro, that's not your territory, right? That's ours. Right. If you're negotiating and if you're expecting in the short term, like before Saudi Arabia can go and start buying Chinese weapons, right, however long that takes, if you expect in the short term that we're going to resume this relationship, right, well, then that's con territory. You're not ending anything. You might be pausing. You might be conditioning, that sort of thing. And, and you can sort of say that's our ground. <laughs> and, and, you know, there are practical ways in which this can happen, right? We have, for example, we already have the Arms Export Control Act, right, which requires Congress to review proposals for military aid, right? So, for example, the, the con can say, you know, we already live in a world where we have a means of doing this. What we should be doing is we should be carefully, you know, reviewing our military aid. We should be potentially going and dialing back some of it. Uh, if I were the con, I would say, look, I have absolutely no problem with under the Arms Export Control Act, let's go and bring this agreement back up. Let's re-review it, right? And let's cut out some of the stuff that's really used for aggressively. Like, let's cut out cluster bombs and let's what? cut out they need 150 attack helicopters. Yeah, but 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 you know what? We're not going to end it because we're not going to not give them Thad missiles and Patriot missiles when Iran is presently trying to develop its capacity to, you know, shoot uh, ballistic missiles all over the Middle East. We're not going to do that. We're not going to take away cybersecurity and counter espionage stuff that we're providing them, right? So we're all for under the arms uh, under the Arms Export Control Act, going back, reviewing, pausing, delaying, modifying, whatever verb you want to use. We're down for that. What we're not down for is just flat out ending and been taking away any form of protection right from this you know flawed deeply flawed country that has frankly been a staunch ally of the United States for decades that's the only thing we're opposing and that sort of is how the con stakes out the reasonableness grounds we're not defending Saudi Arabia we know they've done a lot of bad things but the solution is not to just sort of we're gonna shut off the lights you know flip the breaker walk out of the building padlock it and never come back because that's what you have to get us to do pro and again it's deceptive in an event like public forum where we so rarely get up and read like lengthy frameworks and read definitions, you'd be surprised how often understanding the framework, whether you you know spend a lot of time in the case on it or not, how much it can matter. Right. And this is another example. I, I mean, for us, it's a really big part of it for a reason. And yeah. I think for public forum, especially on topics like this, the same should probably apply. Last thing I got real quick is um, I did want to mention that you know a lot of times I think that what we call the, the politics disad is kind of a nonsensical argument. Yeah. It's like if we do X then uh, the politics, you know, the, 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 um, a certain political party or a certain politician will look good or look bad and that will lead to other consequences from them. I do think there is kind of a viable po uh, politics disad on this 
uh, for the con, and it, it, it comes from an article uh, in the Atlantic, which I will, uh, which I'll link to, and we'll put it in the notes below. But it basically says that, you know, one of Trump's strongest uh, playing, the strongest cards in his deck is his appeal to sort of blue collar workers, right? And that even if the number of jobs is not that great in absolute terms, him bringing back this $110 billion deal that looks really big is something that, that is very popular with his right. base, right? Mm -hmm. And the argument says, if this, if we were going to cut off aid to Saudi Arabia, the way it would, would have to happen would be by Congress not approving it, right, under, under the Arms Export Control Act, right? Trump is not going to change it. Trump negotiated the deal. He's been, he's not changed anything since the Khashoggi matter. So it would involve Congress coming in and basically saying, we're going to get rid of this $110 billion in manufacturing. And the argument would be that this would make it more likely that Trump would get like reelected. It would make Congress weaker. They would, they would be less likely to get reelected. And then you might try linking to basically Trump is a really bad president. He does, he says terrible right. things. He's a risk of war and that sort of stuff. You know, you have to be judge you have to be judged carefully with those if you're in a district with a lot of lay judges if you're in a district that's particularly conservative like here in mississippi you know saying trump is the worst in the world and, and trying to probably run a probably, won't go probably not the best you. idea <laughs> on the other hand if you're debating you know in a in an or coastal urban area and you or you've got a lot of debate uh you know, coach judges that judge you. Yeah. This is a very good article that sort of says this is the red meat. This kind of arms manufacturing is the red meat that Trump thrives on. And if Congress takes it away from him, it's going to make him look better and make them look right. worse in the eyes of some very key swing voters. So if you wanted to run a little bit of a squirrely argument that gets away from some of the other stuff, I think that that is not the greatest argument in the world. But, but it's something it's, you could do. But it's not as re it, it's viable. It can be done, unlike a lot of times. The other thing is, it's one of my favorite it's a squirrel and if your opponent chases it for a minute or a minute and a half trying to argue like something about trump that's all the better yeah i mean with squirrel arguments you have to weigh the idea you have to weigh your cost in reading it versus their cost in responding and if you can read an argument very quickly and it's you know you have to be able to make it in good faith we're not going to say ridiculous things but if you can make it in good faith and read it quickly and you think it's going to cost them an entire or half an entire speech to respond that might be a good trade-off but anyway uh, I, all i'm saying is the politics disad argument which is you know uh, not usually very strong on this it may have some some legs to stand on so that's all i got on the con you guys yeah, anything else I think, I think we're, we're about good. Okay, guys, we will uh, come right back in just a second with a few parting thoughts. All right, so now that we've constructed our case, we're going to talk about some final thoughts. That's her so one first, joke, folks. That's her one <laughs> statutorily mandated joke. So, uh, first, we have to thank our sponsors yep. Goldfish and Subway, the official um, meals of the Mississippi State Debate Program. Um, and also, we're going to shamelessly plug go follow us on Twitter, go follow us on Instagram, all that stuff. Yeah, please do. Um, I think it's only Twitter. Like, our team we has have an, an Instagram. Yeah, our team has an Instagram. Hail State but, Debate has yeah, um, a Twitter. Our final thoughts this time are a little bit unusual. Um, Next month's topic is about housing. We want yeah. to put in a real quick plug <laughs> for the Rent Relief Act choice. The, there, there's, Please there's, there's option two options. One. Option two makes no sense. The yeah. first option is the United States federal government should pass the Rent Relief Act of 2018. Please vote for that. Okay. Because the other one is the United States should promote the development of market rate housing in urban neighborhoods. What does promote mean? What is market rate housing? I thought all... Housing I mean, it's basically it's basically rates. like housing that doesn't have rent controls on it. But bottom line is, the first one is debatable. It's got pluses and minuses, a lot of different ones. It's also a very specific bill. The second one sucks. The other one says promote. We don't know what promote means. And it, if it were policy debate, we could like come up with a plan. But this is public forum <laughs> debate. So when your opponent says, what does promote mean? You'd be like, I'd love to tell you, but I'm actually not allowed to. I can't give you a just, plan. Just say the definition of promote, and right. that's all you can do. So vote for the Rent Relief Act. Not not like in real life, necessarily, but vote for it. Uh, vote for it as the topic. They can't um, vote. They can't what? legally vote. Right. Okay. So anyway. Um, okay. So anyway. But otherwise, uh, it's going to be an interesting balanced topic. I think it's really good. There are some definitional issues, particularly with what end means. And I think you need to be very clear on that. Uh, I think you need to be, you know, pretty clear if you're the con about how there are a lot of other reasonable options and things that we could do. We're not saying Saudi Arabia is perfect or even good. We're saying they're necessary and there are other ways that we can punish them and have leverage over them. And in fact, as the con would say, the, the best way to ensure we have no 
leverage is to do what the resolution says and to basically just completely shut the lights off and walk away. If you're the pro, you've got to win that ending means ending the current deal. And that's what gives us leverage, right, to go in and negotiate. It's something is better than nothing. Trying something to change their behavior is better than nothing. And, you know, also, you know, foreign military aid and foreign military sales are counterproductive in general. Right. But over, overall, I think it's a good resolution where the better prepared team should win most of the rounds. Right. Yeah, general tips and tricks, just read everything you can on yeah. the Saudi Arabia Yemen crisis. Read everything you can about just arms sales in general and have some good blocks written. Basically, take your con case and write rebuttals to it and do the same thing with your pro case. Right. Yeah. On the pro, be prepared if you don't win the framework argument, but understand that it's not a total lost cause, but some prayers might help. Um, on the con, <laughs> uh, pretty much just out-resource them, uh, out-recent them, and yeah, that's it. Just be read up on it. Have anyway, some good general knowledge. Big thing also, one more thing, you are going to have lay judges. This is across yeah. the world. It's not something that most people think about Especially with often. Yemen, it's not so very advertised a lot in the media. take a step back, slow down, and explain what you're saying very clearly. Even if it means you say a little less, they're not going to remember any of it anyway. Yeah, <laughs> and we always are big proponents. Slow down and tell your story. Give your lay judges a chance to breathe and to catch up. They're good people. They are helping you. They're making you a better debater. Give them a chance to catch up and understand what you're saying always and always be respectful of them but otherwise it's going to be a big month we know a lot of you have qualifiers for things like nsca if you go to ncfl we know there are a lot of toc potential bids out there for you and so we wish you the best of luck happy valentine's day and uh, we hope that you have a fantastic uh, february and we will see you in march hopefully talking about the rent relief act until then as always have fun work hard and hail state